19. Position defined and illustrated. First, the principle of position. All spiritual life and growth is based upon the principle of position. It can be summed up in one word, which is source. Through physical birth, we enter our human family position, from which source we derive certain characteristics. We are the product of our position, and just so in our spiritual birth. When we're born again, the risen Lord Jesus is the source of our Christian life. In him we are positioned before our Father, in whom we live and move and have our being. Acts 17 verse 28. For we are his workmanship, created or born anew in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 10. Our Father in redeeming and recreating us, raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2 verse 6. Our position, the source of our Christian life, is perfect. It is eternally established in the Father's presence. When we received the Lord Jesus as our personal Saviour, the Holy Spirit caused us to be born into him. He created us in the position that was established through his work on Calvary. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. This is the eternal position in which every believer has been placed, whether he's aware of it or not. The Christian who comes to see his position in the Lord Jesus begins to experience the benefit of all that he is in him. His daily state is developed from the source of his eternal standing. Our condition is what we are in our Christian walk, in which we develop from infancy to maturity. Although our position remains immutable, our condition is variable. Through the exercise of faith, our eternal position or source affects our daily condition. But in no way does our condition affect our heavenly position. We read in Colossians 3 verse 1 that if ye being risen with Christ, or since you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And Ephesians 6 verse 10 we read, be strong in the Lord, be empowered through your union with him and draw your strength from him. When we concentrate on our condition, we're not living by faith, but by feelings and appearances. The inevitable result is that we become increasingly self-conscious and self-centered. Our prime responsibility is to pay attention to the Lord Jesus, to rest or abide in him as our position. There will then be growth and he will be more and more manifest in our condition. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3.18 If the believer does not know of his position in the Lord Jesus, nor how to abide in him as his very life, there will be but one result. He will struggle in his unchristian condition rather than rest in the Christ-centred position. In most cases, a believer is more aware of his condition than of his position. This is the reason for so much failure and stagnation. If we are to grow and become fruitful, our faith must be anchored in the finished work of our position in Christ. There is no basis for faith in our changeable, unfinished condition. Your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 5 Scriptural, fact-centred faith in the Lord Jesus as our position before the Father is the one means of experiencing that finished work in the growth of our daily condition. Spiritual birth placed us in our accepted position from which our spiritual condition is being completed by faith. 
which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2 verse 10. Every Christian has been positioned forever in the risen Lord by spiritual birth. But only the believer who knows grows. It is faith in the facts of our position that gives us the daily benefits of our growth in our condition. If the believer is not clearly aware of the spiritual truths of the word, he cannot exercise the necessary faith for growth and service. He can only seek his resources in the realm of self. Some of the wonderful positional truths are set forth for our faith in the scriptural illustration of the grain of wheat and the vine and the branch. First, the grain of wheat. In John 12, 24, the Lord Jesus said that except a corn or a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. This principle of life out of death was then established at Calvary's cross, where he, as the grain of wheat, died and rose again. In his resurrection, he brought forth the much fruit out of his death. Everyone who would ever place his trust in Christ as Saviour, every little grain of wheat, was resident in or identified with the grain of wheat, Jesus, the head of the new spiritual harvest. Every believer is included in the much fruit of his death and resurrection. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, so shall we also in the likeness of his resurrection. Romans 6 verse 5. Secondly, there's the principle of reproduction. There's another wonderful principle involved here. Like produces like. We read and God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind. Genesis 1 verse 11. Our Lord Jesus, as the grain of wheat, having fallen into the ground in death, and having risen again unto life eternal, is still bringing forth the much fruit after his kind. For whom he did foreknow, that's God, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Romans 8, 29. The Lord Jesus is our life, and therefore as we grow spiritually, the family likeness is manifested. We are gradually conformed to his image, who himself is the express image of his person, of God's person. Hebrews 1 verse 3. And when he shall appear, we shall be completely like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3 verse 2. In the natural realm, the first grain of wheat contained, complete and perfect, the life of every subsequent grain of wheat to this day. It did not abide alone, retaining all, but fell into the ground and died, finding resurrection in the much fruit of life out of death. This same principle applies in the spiritual realm. The position, the source of life of every believer, as the grain of wheat, is God's firstborn grain of wheat, our Lord Jesus Christ. Each of us is after his kind. We have his life. Thus, when we speak of our position, we refer to our place in the risen Lord. Our life is hid with Christ in God. Colossians 3 verse 3. The principle of position, therefore, both natural and spiritual, is that life in its fullness and completeness is resident in the source and is transmitted through birth and growth. Resurrection life is explicitly after its kind. It is conformed to the image of its positional source. The Lord Jesus Christ, 
as the father's grain of wheat took our place at Calvary, and his death and resurrection brought forth the much fruit of similar grains of wheat, believers predestined to be conformed to the image of God's Son. There is a stillness in the Christian life. The grain of wheat must fall into the ground and die. Then if it die out of death, life, fullest life, will blessedly abound. It is a mystery no words can tell, but known to those who in this stillness rest, something divinely incomprehensible, that for my nothingness I get God's best. Next, we look at the vine and the branch. Consistent with the principle of position and the principle of reproduction, our risen Lord Jesus is the vine. And as such, he brings forth fruit after his kind. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. John 15 verse 5 In the natural realm, the life that is already complete in the vine is increasingly supplied to the growing branches. The healthy condition of the branches is contingent upon their abiding in their position in the vine. The branch is not only a product and a living part of the vine, but that which is produced in the branch is also the fruit of the vine. Actually, the branch produces nothing. Nothing either for the vine or for others, or for itself even. The vine, the positional source, has everything to do with the development and fruitfulness of all its branches. The chief responsibility of the branch is to just rest to rest just where it was born, to abide in its living position, in its living source. As the believer rests in his position, the life of the vine, the fruit of the spirit, is manifested in his condition. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control as we read in Galatians 5.22. The life of the vine is the life of the branch. The true vine is established at the right hand of our Father in glory and is the source from which our Christian life flows. The indwelling Spirit of Christ is the living link between him in heaven and our spirit here on earth. For we read in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Next, we look at taking our position. We take our position not by attempting to get into it, but simply by seeing that we are already positioned in the Lord Jesus. We abide in him by resting in this fact. We have been in this risen position ever since our new birth. As we come to realise this truth and to stand in our standing in him, we begin to experience the daily benefits of our life that is hid with Christ in God. Our attitude becomes, I see my position in the Lord Jesus and I abide there. I rest in him, not only as my saviour, but as my life. Faith in our position will bring growth in our condition. Paul prayed for believers. He said that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Ephesians 1 verses 17 and 18. He also said, Blessed be, blessed be God. 
Blessed be God who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Our Father intends us to know and understand that he has already provided in Christ our life everything required for our Christian life, both in time and in eternity. He is patiently teaching us to have no faith in the old man, in self, and to exercise all of our faith in the new man, that is, in Christ. We are told to do in faith what our Father has already done in fact. At the cross, he freed us from the reign of sin and self. In the resurrection, he united us to the risen Lord Jesus. By faith in the work of the cross, the old man is put off. By faith in our heavenly position in Christ, the new man is put on. Hence we are free to dwell within the very source of every spiritual blessing with which our Father has blessed us. By considering the old man to have been crucified at Calvary, he is put off daily. Romans 6 verse 11. By considering ourselves as newly created in the risen Lord Jesus, we put on the new man. The second part of Romans 6 verse 11. As we escape self's reign of death, we enter into Christ's reign of life. And how to do this? First, put off the old. A. Fact. Romans 6 verse 6 tells us this. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. And then again, in Colossians 3 verse 9. Seeing that you have put off the old man. Positionally, we are separated from the old Adamic nature in our identification with Christ on the cross. B. Faith. In Ephesians 4.22, we read, That ye put off concerning the former conversation, that is, manner of life, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, by faith in our new sanctified position, we turn from, we consider as crucified, the principle of sin and self within. We count ourselves to be new creations in Christ, having died to sin and to self. That is our part in putting off the old man that God put off from us at the cross. Secondly, we put on the new. A fact. We read in Galatians 3.27, For as many as you as have been baptised, that's spiritual baptism, for as many of you have been baptised into Christ, have put on Christ. And in Colossians 3.10 we read, And have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. At our new birth, we were recreated in Christ and our Christian life is now hid with him in God. Colossians 3, verse 3 and 4. Be faith. In Romans 13, verse 14, we read this. Put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Ephesians 4 verse 24, we are told to put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. By faith in the positional fact that our Father has placed us in his Son, we abide in him. We acknowledge our place in him. By faith we stand in the position that he has already given us. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Ephesians 6, verse 1 to 3.
verse 14. Part 20. Justification and assurance and the witness of the Spirit. It may help us to see the importance of the principle of position in our Christian life if we consider the fact that God began training us in positional truth before we were born again. First, justification. According to his faithful ministry, the Holy Spirit brought about an initial conviction of sin by revealing our needy condition. Through varied pressures and circumstances, we came to realise our sinful state before God. Then the Holy Spirit may have used a faithful witness to make clear to us from the word that we were lost sinners, lost sinners positionally, that we were in the wrong family, that we had been born into the fallen, sinful, condemned Adamic line. For as in Adam, all die. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. In our natural birth, we were born dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2, verse 1. And in Romans 5, verse 17, we read that by one man's offence, that's Adam's offence, by one man's offence, death reigned. In his perfect love and holiness, God made it possible for us to be removed from our position of death in Adam and to be eternally born anew into his family through our position in the Lord Jesus Christ. By his grace, we were brought to turn from our natural fallen condition and position and to believe on his son as our own personal saviour, our new position before God. Much of this wonderful transaction and transition, no doubt, was not understood at the time. However, it is all important that the truths of our new birth and justification become crystal clear if we're to experience the benefits of our position in Christ. Superficiality in this foundational step inevitably makes for shallowness and for immaturity throughout our subsequent walk. The meaning of justification is to pronounce righteous, not to make righteous. What is imputed is not, in fact, imparted. To be justified means that the believer is viewed in Christ as righteous and is treated as such by God. The righteousness of our position in the Lord Jesus is increasingly manifested in our condition as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3, 18. And in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30, we read this. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us righteousness and redemption. Until we clearly see our positional perfection of our justification in Christ, our conception of and faith in all other aspects of our position will be out of focus. In the Old Testament type, God explained to Israel that the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Leviticus 17 verse 11. Now, the value of the life sacrificed is the measure of the worth of the blood shed. In that these type sacrifices were animals, innocent and spotless though they were, still it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Hebrews 10 verse 4. All this was a cancellation in anticipation of God's perfect sacrifice of the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John 1 29. God the Son became also the perfect Son of Man, in order that he might go to the Father's altar 
the cross of Calvary, and there willingly shed his precious blood in full atonement for our sins. Complete payment made, he was free to rise again in resurrection, ascended and glorified eternal life. And in Ephesians 1 verse 7 we read this, that in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. There are two important factors in this verse. First, in whom we have redemption. Here we have our position of justification. When we received him as saviour, he received us and we were born into him in newness of life. His life. And secondly, because of the perfection of his atonement, it was all according to the riches of his grace. Complete and eternal justification is a gracious gift, utterly impossible to be earned in any way whatsoever. In Romans 4 verse 5 we read this, To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. A further fact to be remembered is that all of our sins were future at the time that they were paid for, since the work of the cross was accomplished when we were yet unborn. Our Father took everything into consideration before he made a single move on our behalf. Hence we can be fully assured that all our sins, past, present and future, all have been forever forgiven. In Acts 13, verses 38 and 39, we read this. Through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things. Since justification is in Christ and not in ourselves, it is a truth of position and not condition. We receive justification in the Lord Jesus by faith, in the word of God. It is a fact believed, not an experience received. It has nothing to do with our condition, but it has everything to do with our position. However, as we rest in our justified position, our spiritual condition is affected. We experience something of the newfound peace and joy of the Lord and his love for us. Secondly, we look at assurance. The blessed assurance of salvation, and of justification in particular, is based squarely on our position in the Lord Jesus as our righteousness. Being non-experiential, justification can never be founded on our condition. Assurance of justification results when we realise what our Father has done and said. It is never based on feelings. Someone said that because God has spoken, I am sure. Because I am sure, I feel the rest. In Colossians 3 verse 2 we read this, Set your mind on the things above and not on the things that are on earth. It is here that the first major mistake in our Christian life is often made. In taking the position of justification by faith in the Lord Jesus, this new standing of life began to make a marked difference in our state. Because of this, we shifted the basis of our assurance from eternal position to temporal condition. We looked and felt and sounded saved Hence, we were assured of our salvation. But then one morning came the dawn. We didn't look very saved and we didn't feel very saved. And so we didn't sound very saved either. All day long, everything and everybody went wrong. And by nightfall, we found ourselves at the end of our assurance. Thoroughly shaken, we determined to rectify the matters the next day. 
On that day we strove to look saved and to feel saved and to sound saved. But because we were centred in our condition, all was wretched and failure. We even began to question our salvation. If the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us, we asked. Judges 6.13 In the Lord's time, the Comforter refocused our faith on our position by means of the word of God. And our assurance of salvation was again anchored upon the rock, Christ Jesus. With this assurance re-established, our condition began to improve as a result of the position in which we stood by faith. We had learned our first important lesson. That is, the necessity of knowing and abiding in our position in Christ. Apart from this abiding, there is nothing but frustration and failure. Isaiah 32 verse 17 says this, And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Third, we look at the witness of the Spirit. The Spirit himself thus testifies together with our own spirit, assuring us that we are children of God. Romans 8 verse 16. It is a temptation for many to yearn after something more tangible than the positional testimony in the word in order to be more sure of their assurance. But it is at this point that the faithful Holy Spirit would teach us total reliance on the word of God with nothing added. James 1.21 reads this. Receive with meekness the engrafted word. There may be other grounds for assurance of our salvation, such as we read in 1 John 3.14, that we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. But this is secondary. It's not foundational. Besides, there will be times when our love for our brethren may falter. And then what of our assurance? The witness of the Holy Spirit is his witness to the word of God, wherein lies God's revelation of our eternal position. And in that word he testifies concerning the Lord Jesus, who is our position before God. Although the Holy Spirit abides within and witnesses to our spirit, we must remember that the human spirit lies beyond the range of consciousness. Therefore, assurance of salvation is not gained through the senses. As we rest in our position by faith in the scriptural facts, the spirit of truth gives us a deep and inexplicable assurance that cannot be altered. We not only believe, we know. Our knowledge is established in the eternal, spirit-ministered scripture. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. 2 Timothy 1.12 Oh, it seems so simple and solved during the infant stages of our Christian life. But the Lord must take us on from milk to meat. He must take us on to become responsible, spiritually intelligent, adult believers. We must not only become firmly and established, clearly established in the deeper truths ourselves, but we must be qualified to share them effectively with others. Once we are sure and sound, the Lord can establish others through us. But if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? 1 Corinthians 14 verse 8. Until we are solidly founded upon the first principles of spiritual birth, we cannot be taken on to the principles of growth and maturity. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. 
but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, unto maturity. Hebrews 5, 13 and 14 and chapter 6, verse 1. As the electronic eye of the space capsule locks onto its designated star for guidance and maintenance on its heavenly course, so are we to fix our eye of faith on our heavenly position, on the bright and morning star. Thus, in our fixing our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, we shall find experientially that the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. Hebrews 12, 2 and Proverbs 4, 18. Part 21. Reconciliation and Acceptance. Condition and Position. The settled assurance of our justification is not simply to make us sure of getting into heaven, but to prepare us for further spiritual progress. Assurance of our justified position in Christ gives us sureness in each subsequent step of our spiritual development. By grace we were born anew, being justified freely by his grace. Romans 3.24 And by grace we grow. We are told to grow in grace. 2 Peter 3 verse 18 We must stand in the first principle before we can go on from there to maturity. Until we rest assured on our position of justification, we are not spiritually prepared for the positional truths of our reconciliation to and acceptance by God. First, we look at reconciliation. The ground of our reconciliation to God is justification from the penalty of sin. In the Lord Jesus, we were justified from the death penalty of sin thereby enabling God to reconcile us to himself. Justification frees us from death. Reconciliation brings us into life. We read in Romans 5 verse 10, For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, it is much more certain now that we are reconciled that we should be saved. That is, that we should be daily delivered from sin's dominion through his resurrection life. To be reconciled is to be brought into right relationship, into harmony. Being dead in our sins, we were completely cut off from any relationship with the God of life. Spiritually, we were the children of the devil. John 8, 44. Instead of seeking to bring to life and reconcile the fallen Adamic nature, which is an impossibility because that life is enmity towards God and cannot be subject to the law of God as seen in Romans 8, 7. Instead of seeking to bring to life and reconcile the fallen Adamic nature, our Father recreated us in the life of the Lord Jesus. He placed us in a totally new position, out of Adam, into Christ. Ephesians 2.5 tells us that even when we were dead, he made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same new life with which he quickened him. Self cannot be reconciled to God. Since we were born sinners and therefore were enmity against God, our reconciliation to him was no simple matter. It took the cross of Calvary to solve the problem. There, as lost and alienated sinners, 
we were identified with the Lord Jesus in his death unto sin and resurrection unto God. We were raised from the dead as new creatures in Christ, as new creations in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Being made partakers of the divine nature, as we see in 2 Peter 1.4, we were completely and eternally reconciled to the Father. We read in Colossians 1, 20-22 that having made peace through the blood of the cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works yet hath now he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Our present condition is infinitely inferior to our eternal position, but our Father accepts us, not in ourselves, but in his Son. Our Lord Jesus so completely justified us in his death and resurrection that our Father is absolutely just in eternally reconciling us. His love and life are free to flow, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 All things are from God, who through Jesus Christ reconciled us to himself, that is, he received us into favour and brought us into harmony with himself. 2 Corinthians 5.18 Due to his work of justification and reconciliation, there is full acceptance for us. And so now we look at acceptance. So here we have one of the most vital positional subjects and yet it's relatively unknown among believers today. All too few are enjoying the benefits of acceptance in their daily walk. The believer who is not aware of his position of acceptance in Christ is caught in the struggle to improve his condition in order to feel acceptable to God. But the believer who abides in the Lord Jesus as his righteousness and acceptance is freed from the futile self-effort. Standing in his position, he trusts Christ to manifest himself increasingly in his own life. He is free from the burden of himself and has become burdened on behalf of others. God hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18. Next we look at condition. So first of all we must consider the area in which we are not acceptable by God, nor ever can be. It is only natural for us to feel that our spiritual walk and service make us acceptable to the Father. We imagine that it's our responsibility, with his help of course, but our responsibility to live and to serve so faithfully and so fruitfully that he'll approve of us and therefore continually and abundantly bless us. We are making the natural mistake of depending on condition instead of position for our acceptance. Important as it is, service is often a condition-centred Detriment in the lives of many zealous believers. When service is given predominance over fellowship with and growth in the Lord Jesus, doing instead of being takes over our lives. Fellowship and growth must ever take precedence over service and activity. Otherwise, spiritual declension sets in. In this reversal of God's order for us, the heart seeks satisfaction and a sense of acceptance through production or law instead of reception or grace. Bible study and prayer 
as well as one's outlook, must become exclusively service-centred. Instead of life bringing forth service, service becomes the life. And thus, as long as the service goes well, then the servant is happy and feels accepted. But once the service wanes, or fails to produce results, all else fails with it. We are to be sons, not servants. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. Galatians 4, 7. In time, we begin to realise that there is something very wrong with this entire concept. We become aware that our walk and service are less and less acceptable even to ourselves. In seeking to do rather than to be, in attempting to give out more than we take in, our condition becomes barren and carnal. We have been depending on self to do what only Christ can do in our life. The further we move on this tangent, the more active and malignant the self-life appears to be. What the condition-centred believer does not realise is that God himself is causing this shattering revelation of self. He takes us into situations and to relationships that finally cause us to face up to the fact of our failure as Christians, our nothingness, our total unacceptability in ourselves. Not until we understand that in our flesh there dwelleth no good thing at all. Romans 7.18, can we rest in our position of complete acceptance in the Lord Jesus just as we are? To abide in Christ and to consent to be loved while unworthy is the believer's positional privilege and responsibility. Love functions according to its nature, not according to the quality of its object. The believer who is not abiding by faith in the acceptable one, but who is relying on his personal condition for acceptance, is hopelessly handicapped in the matter of fellowship and growth and service. He is entangled in the self-effort of working to improve his condition and is inevitably cast down in utter defeat. How can a defeated, depressed, self-centred Christian enjoy fellowship with the Father or be at peace with him? And yet devastating as this Romans 7 trek is, it is our Father's preparation of us in order that we may shift our reliance and faith from our condition in ourselves to our position in Christ. Not I, but Christ. Galatians 2.20 So finally we look at position. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1, 5 to 7. In learning to take our position in the Lord Jesus and thereby to abide in him as our acceptance, we grow to expect less and less from ourselves and more and more from him. My soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. Psalm 62 verse 5. As we become more fully established in our position, we are increasingly willing to reject self, to leave all that sinful source on the cross for daily crucifixion. This progressive freedom from the dominion of self gives us a deepening rest in the Lord Jesus. We become rooted and grounded in the source of life where we grow effortlessly and, and fruit is born to his glory. Self-effort produces the works of the flesh, 
as we read in Galatians 5, 19 to 21, while positional rest fosters the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Abide in me. That's your position. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. John 15 verses 4 and 5. Although we abide in the Lord Jesus as our position, we are ever aware of our condition in ourselves. We are concerned about the sinfulness of self, but no longer do we depend on improvement in that realm for our acceptance. We are resting on a position, in a person who is fully and forever accepted by God, one in whom there is no improvement necessary or possible. We have exchanged unimprovable self for the perfect one. Established in our position, we become increasingly aware of our acceptance in him and are more free to fellowship with our Father. In this blessed communion, we grow, becoming more manifestly conformed to his image. We are all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord and are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3.18 We are basically Christ-centred instead of self-centred. Through our position in him we have peace, joy, and fellowship which abides all along our cross-centred path as our spiritual condition is developed. One of the foremost benefits of resting in our position of acceptance is the deep and undying assurance that God is for us. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. Corinthians 1.20 There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8 verses 1 and 31. As the Holy Spirit applies the finished work of the cross to the sinful source within, this inner crucifixion may lead us to think God is against us. But it is just the opposite. Everything he takes us through is for our spiritual growth. All things work together for good to those that love him to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Romans 8, 28 and 29. Therefore, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans 8.32 For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 4.15 what a safe and impregnable position is ours in Christ. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation, my high tower. Psalm 18 verse 2. 
When the accuser of the brethren points his maligning finger at the self-life within, at our condition in ourselves, seeking to get us to question our acceptance, we are able to rest in our position and point to Christ. We are well aware of self's unacceptability, but we are much more aware of our acceptance in the Beloved. The enemy can never touch him, and our life is hid with Christ in God. Colossians 3 verse 3 Satan may be the counsel for the prosecution, but we have two counsels for defence, the advocate at the throne and the advocate within, to say nothing of the fact that the righteous judge is our father. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of his people. Hebrews 2.17 Our Father hath reconciled us to himself in a way that enables him to be consistent with himself, being both just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Romans 3 verse 26. 22. Completeness and security. Each step of faith we take concerning the facts of our position prepares us for the following one, since each succeeding step is established on all that proceeds. Our faith grows by feeding on properly related scriptural truths. For precept must be upon precept, line upon line. Isaiah 28 verse 10. And in Psalm 37 23 we read that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Many hungry hearted believers are struggling to get into the experience of Romans 8 when they are not yet resting in the facts of Romans 3. They feel guilty because they fall far short of the heights of Ephesians and Colossians, when in fact they do not adequately know the peace with God in Romans 5, to say nothing of identification with Christ in Romans chapter 6. The experience of Romans 7 is well known, however. It is absolutely necessary to allow the Holy Spirit to take us along in God's sequence of scriptures, as each plane of truth is foundational for the next. Skip over one and firm footing for the next is lost. Hold up my goings in thy paths, that my footsteps slip not. Psalm 17 verse 5. First, complete in him. Once we are scripturally assured of our justification, reconciliation and acceptance in the Lord Jesus. We are to feed on the truth of our completeness in him. We read in Colossians 2 verses 6, 7, 9 and 10 the following. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord by faith, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. All we will ever need for our Christian life, now and forever, is ready and waiting in the Lord Jesus, complete and accessible. Our condition is absolutely dependent on our completed source. Faith rests on our Father's scriptural testimony as to what he has already done for us and with us in Christ. Never on what he is doing for us and with us in our present condition. Faith in the vine brings forth fruit in the branches. Resting in our position in the Lord Jesus has a direct effect on our condition. When we know that our Father has already made us complete in Christ, we are able to trust him in the midst of his development of the completeness of our spiritual condition. 
Without the knowledge of this finished work in the Lord Jesus, our faith lacks the necessary confidence that he will make sure progress in our daily growth. Think for a moment of the positional truth outlined in 2 Corinthians 5.17. We read, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In the Lord Jesus, we are altogether new creations, born anew and complete in him. He is the eternal source from which our condition is to develop. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ, that is, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined or planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time so that we would walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. Ephesians 2 verse 10. Even though the work is complete in Christ, there is nothing automatic about our experience of it. Ours is the responsibility of faith. We are not only born anew by faith, but we are to live by faith, to walk by faith and to grow by faith, to enter intelligently and cooperatively into that which our Father has established for us in Christ. By faith we are to put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Ephesians 4.24 This simply means that we are to rest in our position in the Lord Jesus as our life. We are to abide there because we have already been established there, born there, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, Colossians 3.10. And in Galatians 3.27 we read this, For as many of you as have been baptised, that is, spiritually baptised by the Holy Spirit, for as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. And again in Romans 13 verse 14 we read, But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfil the lusts thereof. The Lord Jesus is put on as we abide in him by faith. Our risen Lord is full provision for our Christian life and service, and the cross is the only provision we have for the self-life. As we confidently rest in the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit gives us the things of Christ by means of growth. As a result, our condition begins to reflect what we already are in position. By faith, we abide and live in him. By faith, his life is developed and manifested in us. Oh, my little children of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you, said Paul, in Galatians 4 verse 19. And so we are secure in Christ. Based on the preceding facts, the eternal security of the believer becomes a foregone conclusion. Once the Holy Spirit establishes the Christian in the previous steps, there can be no question about this one. But without the required scriptural preparation, there is bound to be a nagging question mark hovering in the background. Am I unconditionally and forever saved? Or am I on probation? The secure believer may now and then be accosted by those who strongly oppose any thought of unconditional eternal security. They refer to it as that damnable doctrine and insist that such a belief results in lawlessness. What these dear people fail to grasp is that the believer who truly stands in the grace of positional security is the one who most fully fears God and hates sin. And he hates sin for what it is, not just for its consequences. Moreover, his is not a slavish fear, it isn't a fear of losing God's love, but of offending and grieving it. In Psalm 103 verse 4 we read this. 
but there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. The fear of the secure believer is a reverential trust, coupled with a hatred of evil. In Proverbs 8.13 we read that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And in Titus 2.11 and 12 we read this, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. Grace banishes all guesswork and gives one assurance. The law keeps one guessing. The truth of security holds the Christian firm in the midst of the process of growth. It is the insecure believer who is naturally unstable and flounders from one experience to another, never learning and therefore never arriving at the truth. Resting in our eternal position frees us from the futile and sinful self-effect of trying to make our condition the basis of our security. Abiding in our eternal security in Christ gives the steadfastness of faith necessary for the Holy Spirit to carry on his gracious ministry within, that of dealing with self in crucifixion, and thereby causing us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. The spiritual explanation for opposition to true eternal security is not the claim that it produces lawlessness. It is rather that those who oppose do not exercise faith in the word of God, which would enable them to see and to accept their position in the risen Lord for assurance acceptance and security. They are condition-centred, hence self-centred and earth-bound. On the other hand, the believer who knows that he died to sin and has been recreated in the risen Lord Jesus understands that he has no other position before God than the very life of Christ. Galatians 3.26 tells us, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And in Romans 8.17 we read, And if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And in 1 John 3 verse 2 we read this, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. It certainly is not yet manifest in our condition what we already are in our position, or what we shall be when he appears. But the resting believer does not rely on appearances. Neither is he affected one way or the other by his condition. He knows he is accepted and secure on a different basis altogether that of his position in Christ, the man of God's choosing. This is not carelessness, but confidence in him. In quietness and assurance we are to continue, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 7 and 8. The believer who rests in the Son of God knows he is eternally secure. For you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Colossians 3 verses 3 and 4. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now received the atonement. Romans 5 verse 11. The believer who rests in the sovereignty of God knows he is eternally secure. For whom he did foreknow he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover whom he did predestinate them he also called, and whom he called them he justified. 
and whom he justified them also glorified. Romans 8, 29 and 30. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy is what we read in Jude, verse 24. The believer who rests in the justice of God knows he is eternally secure too. To declare his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus, Romans 3.26. And again in 1 Peter 3.18 we read this. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. In Romans 8 verse 1 we read this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. The believer who rests in the will of God knows that he is eternally secure. In John 15 verse 16 we read these words. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us redemption. The believer who rests in the love of God knows he is eternally secure. Oh, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee, we read in Jeremiah 31 verse 3. And Paul tells us, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution? For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Romans 8, 35, 38 and 39.